Perfect. Well, welcome. We'll let people uh, start to trickle in. I see the participant numbers um, starting to grow, so that's excellent. Uh, we're pleased to welcome uh, Bob Grimm, who's going to be talking about magnetotelurics on the moon and other worlds today. Um, so before we get going, just some quick reminders on the MNRs. Um, if you want to check out any of the past or upcoming MNRs, it's all on the MTNet website. Uh, we've got links to past presentations, both the YouTube link as well as um, the slides if presenters have chosen to share that with us. And then for any of the upcoming um, talks, all the registration links are there and you can you can sign up. Uh, the next two upcoming talks, we have Alexander, who's going to be giving an EM induction workshop review. And Nisha will be talking about EM induction from tsunamis and the January 15th um, Tonga eruption. So those will be two great upcoming talks. I encourage you to uh, join us. And today, as I mentioned, we're pleased to welcome Bob Grimm, who's going to be telling us about magnetotelurics on the moon and other worlds. So give a quick um, bio and background of Bob. So Bob uh, is the program director in the Solar Systems Division of the Southwest Research Institute in Boulder, Colorado. He's a geophysicist with interest in both planetary and terrestrial exploration. Much of his early work was on the geodynamics of Venus and the thermal and uh, hydrogeological histories of meteorite parent asteroids. While in industry, he researched seismic detection of gas in naturally fractured reservoirs, EM discrimination of UXO, and electrical detection of soil contaminants. He found that EM methods in particular are ripe for application in planetary exploration, which has culminated in the selection of a magnetotelluric instrument for two flights on NASA-sponsored robotic landers with future possibilities for Venus, Mars, and Ceres. Uh, other, research, other recent research includes electrical properties of ice and permafrost and the hydrogeology of Mars. So very pleased to welcome Bob here. I'll stop sharing my, my screen and invite you to open up yours. Thank you, Lindsay. Uh, let me get this going here. Okay. Uh, can you hear me? Can you see my slides? Yes, that looks great. Very good. Well, uh, thank you uh, and Alan for inviting me to present today. I know it's a little off the beaten path. Um, uh, my title slide here uh, might be a little whimsical. I'm, um, you know, I, I certainly think that using a pony is a great way to get uh, your gear into inhospitable or remote locations. And uh, I stumbled across this from uh, uh, the GeoPartner company in Poland. Um, and I only include it here uh, to show that um, there's a vast uh, gulf now uh, in, in trying to get our equipment to other inhospitable locations. Uh, uh, this is a mock-up of, uh, of the lunar lander for the first mission that we'll be on. And I'll also briefly mention some analogy here with seafloor MT. Um, I'm gonna talk about uh, uh, you know, how we wanna do this on other planets. And I'll, I'll focus on four targets, but there's other places in the solar system that uh, EM sounding in particular, and or in general, and that MT in particular could be used at. Um, on the, the a, a lot of the talk will focus on how we got here uh, using data from the Apollo mission. Uh, this is the Apollo 12 lunar service magnetometer. Uh, I'm sorry, I can't see everybody participant list, but I know uh, probably a couple of people who participated uh, in that um, uh, are, are, are in on here today. And uh, I'm excited to show what, you know, could be the next step, uh, understanding of, uh, of the moon's interior with these, with related methods. I've been working on this uh, since the late nineties. Um, this was an early, this is a proposal that uh, uh, was luckily funded um, that started us looking at MT methods for Mars. Uh, and that really sort of picked up in the mid uh, teens, 20 teens, when we started getting funding to work on icy satellites with MT. And that's really what put us in the position to write successful proposals for this active, very active lunar program now. So uh, it's been a long road. Uh, advance. Okay. So, um, you know, what do we learn from uh, 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 EM sounding? Everybody on this call is probably, you know, does, does lots of different kinds of imaging of the earth, but I like to break it down into sort of uh, a couple of really basic uh, approaches. 
The overwhelming control on electrical conductivity is of course temperature because of the Arrhenius relationship, um, huge variation in electrical conductivity over many orders of magnitude uh, depending on temperature. Rock composition was of course important when we're doing kind of, uh, you know, sounding for the thickness of sedimentary basins, comparing uh, sedimentary to igneous rocks, we might be looking at some, you know, contrast in, in, in overall resistivity. But when you go deep into the earth um, uh, and take away most of the extraneous factors, it really comes down to a couple of properties, uh, things that control electrically conductive point defects in the mineral structure. And those are dominantly, well, there's, there's ionic conduction that that's always the background, but um, when you have any kind of quantity of, of iron uh, in a mineral, it can substitute for magnesium in a charge defect, and that's mobile, and that accounts for a big part of electroconductivity. And then water in very small quantities can dissociate into hydrogen and hydroxyl, and the hydrogen uh, ions are mobile and, uh, and can contribute to electroconductivity as well. And then of course, the, you know, the, 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 the biggest thing uh, at shallower depths in the crust is, is the presence of water. Uh, water, of course, itself is very electrically resistive, but put a small quantity of dissolved ions in it uh, and you get a booming electrical conductor. Um, and this is really what got me started in trying to apply EM to the planets because for places like Mars, uh, uh, if, there's, if, this water, if there's water at depth that has been out of circulation for billions of years, it's probably very salty. Uh, and would really light up in an EM sounding. So I will talk about uh, this uh, later in the talk. Just as a point of reference uh, to compare the electrical conductivity of the Earth to what we know or think we know about the other planets, um, that, that because there's no water at the surface pretty much anywhere, even if there water, is water in the interior, we're gonna have very high surface resistivities uh, at the surface and the near surface compared to Earth. Um, and also because these other worlds are, are, are smaller than the Earth, they, they have less internal heat preserved and generated over the, over the aeons. And so their internal temperatures will be lower. Um, so these are um, both factors that will tend to drive up the resistivities uh, 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 or decrease the conductivities um, on, on other worlds. And, and the other factor is that free water uh, is rare. We want to find it where it occurs, but uh, you got to look for it. So given these um, capabilities of what we can learn from EM, let me pose some overall science questions that I'll follow up on. Uh, the moon is the most imminent target. And uh, a big question we have with the moon is, does its interior preserve any layering from its original crystallization from a magma ocean? A big result from Apollo and immediately after is that the moon probably formed from a giant impact of a Mars-sized body uh, with the early Earth. The moon uh, came off of that, most out of mantle material, so iron poor. It, uh, it was molten, uh, and then it probably crystallized in a very distinct structure. That structure uh, is supposedly gravitationally unstable, but it, did it turn over into a perfectly, did it preserve that structure? Did it turn over into a stable structure, or did it get well mixed? Um, the, uh, the, the next question about the moon is, uh, does, its la does its asymmetric structure, uh, if you look at the surface, reflect a deep-seated heterogeneity as well? When you look at the moon, you see the dark parts, which are the, the, the later erupted lava seas or maria, are mostly on the western side of the moon, and they're almost entirely on the near side. So the moon is very asymmetrical, and it was discovered later that there's a chemical asymmetry associated with that. Is that, is that just near the surface or does that go deep into the moon? And lastly, by understanding its temperature structure, we can look at the uh, uh, global thermal evolution of the moon. Another world that uh, uh, only came up uh, uh, on my quote radar uh, in recent years is Ceres. Ceres was explored uh, by a spacecraft um, in the last decade and it, it's, it's, a, it's the largest of the asteroids. Um, and uh, it, it's thought that it's got water in its interior. Uh, uh, the extent of that is not known, but um, there's, there was a, 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 there's a plan to send a lander uh, in the next decade that, that could do EM exploration to look for that water. 
And then at the bottom here is, you know, the, the question that motivated me 20 years ago. There's, you know, it seems you can't open the news without hearing something about water on Mars, but we still don't know whether there is extant liquid water in the interior of, of, of Mars that could truly be a, a possibly a habitat for life. This is sort of a, a, a generic slide for this audience, just talking about, you know, what is EM induction? I, I just still love this figure from Grant and West uh, in the 60s. Um, but for the kinds of uh, work that we do, the, 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 you know, the skin depth is what dominates everything. That, that's, that's what enables us uh, to, to do soundings, to, to, to probe the interior. Uh, and, um, and, you know, something I constantly have to explain to non-geophysicists is that EM induction, EM induction is not intrinsically non-unique, double negatives there, uh, as, is, as are potential fields. It's just that we don't, you know, have complete data ever. We don't have, we don't have full bandwidth um, uh, of, of, of data to do a, a perfect sounding. And then the other thing I have to emphasize a lot is that this is not radar, uh, it is not wave propagation, it is a diffusive process. Now, something that maybe you may not have thought of is what does it actually take to do uh, EM sounding? And I like to think of this as a golden rule that you always need two independent quantities to determine the impedance of the, of the interior. And that's basically the expression of Ohm's law, right? Voltage and current tell us impedance. When we do EM sounding, one quantity is almost always the magnetic field near the target um, on the surface of the earth uh, or, or very near the surface. Uh, and with that, how we get that second quantity is, is what starts to differentiate the different EM methods. So the oldest uh, method, geomagnetic depth sounding, also called the Z over H method, uh, in that we assume that we know what the source field looks like a priori. So that's our second piece of information is the known source field. That is um, almost uniformly restricted to the to the dipole response. I only know uh, uh, studies by Barr uh, and colleagues that that try to look at some higher order harmonics uh, of the SQ field. But um, for everything that's done for kind of global multi-station geomagnetic depth sound sounding, you're always looking at the dipole response, and that's encapsulated in the formulas at the upper right. So by looking at the radial and tangential components, um, you can separate the internal and external fields at degree one and derive as a function of frequency of the skin depth effect, um, what the internal structure is. The second method that I'll talk about extensively is the magnetic transfer function. Of course, everything that we do in geophysics is a transfer function of one kind or another, but this one was used uniquely during the Apollo program. Um, so LSM on this middle chart is the lunar surface magnetometer from Apollo 12. And there happened to be a satellite called Explorer 35 that orbited distantly from the moon. So you could measure the source field directly and its time variations from Explorer 35 and compare that to the surface field at uh, Apollo 12. And hence uh, with that transfer function, get the interior connectivity structure. And then uh, the last method is, of course, MT, where it's the electric field that's providing that second uh, source of info, um, uh, and you don't need anything about uh, the external fields. And then um, uh, I'll mention this briefly at the end, but you know, with active methods, you're generally measuring just magnetic fields, uh, and, and in that case, your second piece of information is that you are providing the source. So let's uh, let's delve into the uh, the moon and the the historical record of the uh, magnetic transfer function. This was done in 1969 and 1970, and as I mentioned, you're comparing the the distant Explorer 35 to the lunar surface magnetometer, and the formula in gold there. It's really two that I combine into one on the left. You're basically saying that the measurement at the surface is the numerator. That's the sum of the external and internal fields. And then the distant measurement is the denominator, that's the external field. And so from that, um, you can uh, form the, um, the induction, the schmucker uh, Wiedel uh, induction parameter C um, as the ratio of those transfer functions. Uh, and uh, C is, of course, widely used in geophysics. 
And one thing you can do with that is turn it into an apparent resistivity uh, as shown on the right. Um, for the, for the, the Apollo soundings were complicated by uh, when, the, when the moon was, was out of the magneto tail and exposed, exposed to the solar wind, the solar plasma flow compresses the induced field and confines it uh, to stay within the moon, which you, know, you measure at the boundary. Uh, so you can see how, the, how the, um, the induced field looks asymmetric in that sketch on the left. Uh, but with the assumption that the entire field is confined, which is an okay assumption when you're not near the unconfined part, um, that's how the, the, the transfer function was evaluated. And uh, in, in, the, in the middle panel uh, is that transfer function uh, as was computed by Lon Hood and colleagues back in the 1980s. And uh, it's a function that increases with frequency. Um, it's unity at a low frequency asymptote because you're basically the, you know, at, at low frequency, the moon is, 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 is not, this doesn't excite an inductive response. And it increases with frequency due to screening by the eddy currents. And in this case, an extra factor due to the solar wind confinement. Um, I've cut this off at a millihertz because as you get into the realm of several millihertz, the wavelength in the solar wind uh, at those frequencies becomes comparable to the circumference of the moon. And at that point, you start to introduce multipoles. Uh, and what I'm gonna show you here is just a dipole solution. So many workers have, have uh, inverted this over the years. Uh, I've shown you a couple here uh, on the right, Lon Hood's original uh, bounds on the conductivity versus depth are outlined in blue. Um, more recently, Amir Khan and colleagues uh, did a, a joint inversion with seismic data, and they got uh, uh, an error envelope that's uh, quite narrow, um, and, uh, but the green line is, is the middle of that. And then recently, I decided to do this again myself, um, and with a regularized inversion, I get uh, the, the black solid black lines and the dotted line in the middle. So um, gratifyingly, uh, uh, the results are all in pretty good agreement, and you can, uh, in fact, fit this conductivity profile to a nice semi-log function to a very high degree of accuracy. Well, what does it mean? Um, the the uh, on the right are my recent fits. Uh, you can see other temperature composition fits in the literature, and uh, I, I've got several profiles here for different representations of the electric of the temperature structure and i'm just you know by trial and error fitting the conductivity to those temperature structures so on the right uh those the magenta uh and uh, red lines are for a convecting lunar interior today and you see that the the data don't come close to that um, i can make a uh, a full-on uh convection or conduction model fit the green but i'm showing you a fit to um, things that have been done in the literature that have other constraints. So the so um, uh, again, Amir Khan's model and uh, and uh, uh, Ganya Penny and colleagues who also did a seismically constrained model as well. Um, and the the fit that I have kind of floats back and forth between them. But uh, you can see that the EMs the sounding is overall giving a result that's that's consistent with prior literature specifically. Uh, seismic seismology as well. And in my model, uh, specifically here, I'm using olivine with a magnesium number of 80 to 85. So what's happening here is that um, the magnesium number is the ratio of magnesium to iron plus magnesium. And remember earlier, we talked about iron as being uh, a dominant uh, conduction me mechanism uh, through the small polaron mechanism. So this number of 80 to 85 is is a little more iron rich than people might think the moon is, but, but not by much. Uh, so this is all moving in the right direction. Um, you can see that the, that the fit would start to diverge uh, at shallower depth. I don't wanna add more iron there because that would sink. Uh, we could. It, could, it could be stuck there at high, vis high viscosity, I don't know. But another possibility is to add water instead. And that's at the few hundred PPM level. And that's consistent with what we know about the moon in the last decade or so. It's not bone dry. Uh, certain um, glasses that were analyzed by Apollo appear to have been brought up from deep source regions 
that that had this level of water in them. So I don't know if this is global, whether it's looking at one of those glass source regions uh, or whether it's just confined to this area that Apollo is in, but this this does open the possibility that um, that there could be water in the upper mantle of the moon. The overarching question, the next question I should say, is that um, the Apollo 12 measurement, which you can see uh, uh, was made uh, here, um, is in this anomalous part of the moon that's focused on the Western near side Maria that is now called the Procolarm or Procolarm, depending how you pronounce uh, Latin, creep terrain. Creep sounds for potassium, rare earth elements, and phosphorus. These are the dregs of the magma ocean, the last stuff to crystallize that doesn't fit into mineral structures easily. And it's thought that for some reason it pooled on this side of the moon uh, and in this quadrant. And that's what led to long lived volcanism as well as these anomalous compositions. So, so um, you know, my question then is, uh, is, is what Apollo 12 saw is, is the deep interior of the moon um, anomalous uh, here, or, or is, is that what the background looks like? The, the fits to the, uh, to the prior literature suggests that, that, it's, that this is the normal moon at depth, but we don't know until we can make measurements outside of this PKT region. So you'll also note that uh, I cut off this graph at 400 kilometers depth um, on, on the shallow end because the frequencies don't go high enough for us to see shallower. So the things we want to look at, we want to do, are to get higher frequencies and to get global coverage. So higher frequencies were attempted, in fact, during Apollo. Um, the magnetic transfer function was evaluated as high as uh, 50 millihertz, I think. Um, and it gets complicated then because you're inducing these multipolar responses. Um, uh, and uh, you also introduce a model dependence on where the solar wind impact is and what its speed was. Uh, so what I did was to merge the low frequency, and high frequency data. They appear in separate publications. There had to be some, you know, smoothing and offsetting involved. Um, and and then I I fit the high frequency data by itself, and I fit it together with the low frequency data. So on the left you see just the high frequency. And um, uh, it agrees uh, uh, in qualitative form with that done by Bruce Hobbs uh, uh, in 1977, most notably seeing this, this kink at about 400 kilometers with a you know, apparently constant conductivity below that. And on the right is my inversion of all the data together, which preserves that uh, shallow structure, but, but bends the structure between 400 and 750 kilometers uh, into a nearly constant conductivity zone. And then it picks up what the deep data alone, the low frequency data alone were showing. So this is very interesting, but I'm not sure that I believe it. I cannot figure out uh, any plausible temperature or composition structure that would fit this, especially this business of a nearly constant um, conductivity over this wide depth range. Uh, it, it looks like mantle convection would do that, but then I don't know why it would uh, go back to conduction in the lower mantle. You could have partial, you could have a partial melt zone that's actually been proposed for, for PKT, uh, but it would have to be a tiny amount of melt in order not to explode the conductivity up into the, you know, semen per meter range. Um, and such a small amount of conductivity would be very fortuitous to catch and it might not even meet a percolation threshold uh, to, uh, to, to have an effect. So I don't know what to do with this. Um, and uh, I did this you know, after I was already ready to do MT, uh, but at this stage, unless any really great ideas come along, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna try to interpret it further. Um, that did bring me to MT. And, and, and the, the advantages of MT uh, in planetary exploration are, are multifold. First, uh, single station. We all like to use um, you know, uh, multiple stations for array coverage or for remote reference, but you know, it's not essential to do MT with multiple stations. And the main thing here is that you don't need any orbital, orbiter uh, as well, which is important in planetary context. 
Also, it's largely insensitive to multipoles. Um, uh, we know that, I mean, we always think of MT as a, as a plane wave, but all that really matters is that the wave, the incident wavelength is much larger than the wavelength in the ground. The wavelength in the ground being two pi times the skin depth at whatever frequency you're at. So this was a, a calculation I did a decade ago showing that even if you excited these multipoles on the moon, uh, MT would not be affected, whereas you can see the big effect on the transfer function. The other thing we can do is, is that, you know, we can exploit, exploit a much bigger bandwidth then with MT than with these, these other methods. And I'm eventually hope to push this up into the hundreds of Hertz uh, for lunar exploration. Uh, in the diagram at the bottom, you see the response for two different lunar interior models at, uh, um, at the top. Uh, this is a weird parameter, what I've called normalized apparent conductivity. It basically turns out to be the transfer function or, or C. You can see the, the, lunar, the prior lunar data that kind of track that, that transfer function form there. Um, but you can see there's, that there's discrimination uh, you know, in the shallower regions of the moon up into the tens of Hertz, and then it gets wonky because you're actually going into propagation. Um, so this turns into a passive radar uh, in the hundreds of Hertz, we think. Uh, whereas on the Earth, because of the higher near surface conductivity that would not occur into the you know, megahertz range. Um, it's possible we might be able to interpret this in these propagative modes um, but uh, even with the inductive response alone, we hope to get below 100 kilometers for the moon. Let me take a quick diversion here into the global coverage aspect. Uh, we could do global coverage for the moon with a lot of empty stations. Maybe that'd be great someday. Um, but at least we can get a global average by considering methods that explicitly average that. Anna Middleholtz uh, published a paper last year where she um, basically did the GDS method applied to um, the moon. Satellite induction uh, methods for the earth got kicked off in the 90s uh, using the ring current. Again, the N equals one uh, dipole response from that. But when the, when the moon is in the magneto tail, um, it's, it's a quasi uniform field that it's exposed to and it induces a dipole response. And that dipole response uh, was very carefully uh, uh, teased out uh, by Anna uh, in the, uh, you can see the, 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 vec the um, vectors alternating polarity in the upper left. Um, and they did a global solution uh, based on that. Um, I think this is a great start, but I would contest the results uh, in terms of how much applicability to the whole moon really came out of it. Um, when you look at the, the, the induction, the, the inductive length scales that were derived uh, in, in blue, you see that she was able to extend it to much longer periods, lower frequencies than was possible uh, with the Apollo data that are shown in black. Um, but the error bars get big, very big, unusably big, I think, um, beyond a period of about 14 hours. And, um, and everything kind of below that was already in the Apollo data set. So, um, uh, you know, the, the, the global averaging uh, does show that it's consistent with Apollo, but it's at a, it's at a, a region only between about 800 and 1,000 kilometers down, not, not the whole moon, uh, and, and about 8% of the volume. So this is a great start. I know Anna is working on other data to try to extend this method. Uh, with other uh, um, other data sets into longer periods. Um, and I think uh, it shows a great promise for the future to help us get that global average for the moon that we can then compare the surface measurements to. Okay, so the moon, uh, activity of the moon has exploded in the, in the last several years because you know the United States space policy has flip-flopped between Mars and the moon since the early 2000s. And, you know, finally, we have an administration now that kept what the last administration wanted to do. And, and that means putting people back on the moon ostensibly now by 2026, maybe not quite so soon. But as part of bringing the whole community along, the scientific community, NASA announced what they call the Commercial Lunar Services Payload Program, where they have a new paradigm. They want to fly two missions a year to the moon, um, which is supposed to be minimal oversight, you know, 
strap your payload on FedEx to the moon, and, and we're gonna get uh, a lot of new science from the moon. It turned out to be harder than this, but it's still, they are still low cost, relatively low oversight missions. Uh, the other moniker that they've used with this is they say, we wanna get more shots on goal. Well, that's kind of disturbing if you're actually uh, providing an instrument because it means they're expecting some fraction, maybe half of these landings to actually fail. They are uh, contracted with many companies, many newcomers to space flight, uh, you know, staff with veterans and new people alike, but uh, it's a new paradigm. So we're lucky that there will be a magnetotelic instrument on two uh, instruments slated to fly uh, uh, in the next couple of years. Everything on this chart is out of date and I put the, the correct dates on here. So we have a lunar magnetotelic sounder that was selected in 2019 that was delivered to the lander uh, last month. And I'll talk about that in some detail. We also had um, a second instrument selected uh, 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 that, that will fly in 2025 that has some improved capabilities. In both cases, we're fortunate to be flying with a heat flow probe as well. That was totally serendipitous for the first selection, but we teamed up together to make this suite uh, for the second one so that we will have heat flow as a boundary condition on whatever temperature profile we derive. Uh, here's where we're going. Uh, the first one is Mari Chrysium. Uh, Mari Chrysium is easily visible to the naked eye as a, as a dot that stands apart from the rest of the dark spots of the moon. Uh, I actually so, uh, suggested it in, in the, the, the first proposal because it is outside of PKT, is on a great circle between the Apollo 15 and 17 heat flow measurements were, uh, and is in a Maria, which is relatively easy to land on and, and work with. Uh, the, the, the heat flow guy, Seichi Nagihara, we teamed up together. Uh, he liked it for a number of reasons. The other payloads on this mission are, are different kinds of experiments that don't really care where on the moon they went. Uh, so we took this to NASA uh, and they approved our landing site. So this is kind of unprecedented in the annals of landing site selection uh, uh, where uh, a, a small group um, basically got to pick it. So we're very grateful for that. Um, the second mission, the landing site was pre-specified uh, by NASA um, as the Schrodinger Basin on the far side of the moon, and our suite was selected uh, for that. They, um, uh, they selected a seismometer uh, to as that, and then um, there's also uh, another electromagnetic experiment that we actually collaborated with uh, in terms of how we do the science. And this will be sort of the first complete geophysical station since Apollo. Let me note that both of these missions are basically only for two weeks on the surface. They are day side uh, solar powered missions. So once it goes into the two week lunar night, uh, everything dies. The seismometer is distinct in that it's basically uh, its own satellite sitting on the deck of the, the mainlander and it will continue to survive for uh, some number of months. But uh, everything else has to be done in the first couple of weeks. So here is uh, our design for the lunar magnetotelluric instrument. The first thing, you know, of course, in spaceflight, everything has to be small um, because you know it's just it's too much mass to and, and cost to to carry heavy things. We're lucky in that we have good signal noise because uh, the fields in the solar wind are strong, uh, and, and in the magnetosphere, we have a lot of integration time. Um, and, uh, and the resistivity of the moon is, is higher than the earth. That'll give us bigger electric fields. So we are able to use a compact flux gate magnetometer alone. Um, we did go to some special lengths to do a pretty long mast, a 2.5 meter deployable to get it away from the uh, lander to eliminate um, stray field noise. But the real innovative thing about this project are the, is the electric field measurement. And this is uh, uh, done by our colleagues at Heliospace. And let me jump to the bottom and say the reason that they can do this is because this is how electric fields are measured on in space physics experiments. They, they use very long uh, wires that are deployed from spinning spacecraft in orbit and measure electric fields over tens or hundreds of meter baseline. And, and everything about this experiment works the same way. So it uses um, a bias voltage uh, to match the plasma potential. That's how the coupling 
is achieved. And then it also has a high impedance preamp and an actively driven circuit to eliminate the capacitive pickup of the wire. This first bullet, these kind of things are done on Earth um, in high resistive environments like Antarctica, um, but uh, uh, the, the bias voltage uh, and the overall plasma treatment um, is unique to the space physics environment. And because we're immersed in a conductive plasma, there's sort of some analogy to marine MT here. Uh, the central electronics box will be provided uh, by my company, Southwest Research Institute, has been provided. So here's what the flight instrument looks like. Um, the, the mast uh, is on the left, the magnetometer is a little white thing on top of it. Everything, most things are black, different people decided they wanted different colors for thermal control. Um, the electronics box is in the middle on the upper left. And then the four electrodes, uh, are the electrodes are, are ballistically deployed um, by a spring. They've got red safety caps on them there. But um, here is a, a, a video of a, of a test deployment um, in the lab, it's in slow motion. So um, this goes out to 20 meters. It pulls out a seven conductor, uh, uh, multi-conductor cable that, um, that's wound in this, uh, it's actually wound by a yarn ball winding machine. We call this the yarn ball. Um, and uh, so 20 meters in each direction plus the lander, we get a baseline of greater than 40 meters. Um, and here's the configuration on a mock-up of the lander by Firefly Aerospace. Uh, two electrode, th three are on one side for convenience. Here's our electronics box. Um, so one is coming towards you. There's another one shooting away from you on the other side of the lander. And then uh, these two go orthogonal. So we have four electrodes, just like in a terrestrial um, MT setup. Um, the second lander uh, has a slightly different configuration. It's a different provider that goes to Schrodinger. Uh, in this case, we are only providing the electric field measurement directly. And we're going to use the magnetic field measurements that were um, already manifested for this mission from this other experiment. So they have a flux gate magnetometer, but also a search coil magnetometer. We would call that an induction coil um, when they're bigger, but it'll give us response up to hundreds of Hertz. And this is the way we want to probe even shallower um, on this second experiment. And so these are all the, the pieces that we would use uh, on the lower left for future experiments for a geophysical network. Um, we'd probably go back to booms uh, for, the, uh, for the magnetometer deployments. And then there's also the possibility that uh, some of these things could be deployed by hand by astronauts uh, in an Artemis landed mission uh, uh, later um, in this uh, uh, in this decade. Uh, I'll switch gears now um, and speed up if you think that's even possible uh, to look at Europa. This is going back in time because our Europa work was uh, what uh, enabled the moon work. Um, EM sounding in, the, Gal in the, Ju the Jupiter system was remarkable because it was completely serendipitous. The Galileo spacecraft uh, orbited Jupiter in the 1990s and they discovered there was a huge dipole signature around every one of the, the big moons. Um, and the, the, the three icy moons, Europa, uh, Ganymede, and Callisto, um, that can be you know, inferred to be a subsurface ocean. And the, the, way that th the reason this was serendipitous is because nobody expected to see uh, a time varying source field. Um, this is very low frequency stuff. And what happens is the, the static field as Jupiter is rotating past the moons. And so you base, so it's it's not perfectly symmetrical, and so you see an 11 hour time varying signal uh, imposed on these moons, and that gave this wampum dipole signature you see at the lower right, and that confirmed that there's a subsurface ocean beneath these. Um, NASA is returning to Europa with something called Europa Clipper, uh, that will go closer uh, to 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 Europa, and they they hope to exploit higher order multipoles of this induction period. And, um, but they really can't, uh, they can continue to investigate the ocean, but they can't really see any shallower. Um, so there was a Europa lander program that was since canceled. We got funded to develop a possible instrument for that, an MT instrument. Um, and our idea was to use magnetospheric waves, sort of like is done uh, on the earth and at the moon to look at any signatures within the ice shell. Um, uh, 
I've got a slide here that's probably going to take too long to go through, but suffice to say that that the discrete frequencies um, from this rotation as the dots is what you would use to discriminate ocean properties, whereas if there's any intrusion in the crust, a, a quote magma body uh, near where the lander uh, landed, um, you could see that with the higher frequency stuff, although um, the thickness and conductivity are of course subject to equivalence. Our design looked uh, uh, simpler than what we ended up with because this was this was what we proposed for the for the lunar instrument later. The the construction of the the mast uh, we thought could be simpler turned to be harder. Uh, in this case, we were going to use just three electrodes to save mass and use one as a uh, as a common reference, but that would still give um, you know 15 meters or so between the electrodes, which again would be sufficient given the expected signal strengths and integration times. Let me switch to Ceres. Um, Ceres is, uh, used to be called an asteroid. Now it's called a dwarf planet. It's the largest body orbiting between uh, Mars and Jupiter, almost a thousand kilometers across. Uh, it was explored by the Dawn mission and many interesting geological features suggested that it had water inside and that you know water or slush was oozing out. So you know volcanoes that looked like they were made out of ice. And, uh, and on the right, uh, you see some um, salts that were left behind in this large crater. Uh, so um, a, a group was approved to study a lander mission uh, to, to land on Ceres, to uh, look at its surface and possibly to return uh, a sample. And an uh, MT instrument was included as part of that. So we studied that uh, extensively a couple years ago, um, taking advantage of some possible improvements to the design to go to a, a longer distance in the lower gravity. The solar wind is weaker out there, uh, but with, um, some, with these changes, we could, we could get sufficient signal. Uh, and in the same way that we looked at Europa, you could discriminate both um, deep, a deep brine layer and any uh, water intrusions, magma active magma bodies essentially, that were um, in, the, in the crust. Um, one fun thing about this mission was that JPL wanted to publicize it better. And so they actually commissioned a storyboard. Uh, this never made it, uh, I don't know where you find this online, but I was given permission to use these, these charts, uh, these, these pictures. And so this shows the lander uh, on the surface of Ceres. The ion rocket engines are actually at the top pointing upwards. Uh, it pushes itself through space uh, with an ion engine and uses a chemical propulsion engine to land. The sample return capsule is the white thing. Uh, and then the little highlighted thing is an electrode being deployed. Um, uh, I don't know how they uh, decided that our yarn ball turned into a, a white disc that got shot out, but uh, there it is. And uh, so the caption reads, electrodes deployed to probe for the presence of brines using electromagnetic sounding. And um, uh, you, you just gotta love this picture. They, they're still visualizing the sounding as, a, uh, as, a, as an active radar and not a passive diffusion, but you gotta love the 1960s era control panel. Um, let me wind up talking about Mars. Uh, this is back again to my roots, uh, wanting to do MT on Mars to look for water. Uh, uh, a mission was sent, a geophysical station was sent to Mars. Uh, it was called InSight. Uh, there was supposed to be an MT experiment on it, but it was descoped early for cost. They went and put uh, a magnetometer back on it, ostensibly as a check on, uh, on the seismic data to make sure there wasn't any magnetic interference in the very sensitive seismometer. Uh, so this was, this was not on any kind of boom. It was body mounted to the lander. And there was a lot of interference effects that Anna Middleholtz and Katherine Johnson have worked hard to try to take out. But the most remarkable thing that came out of this in terms of the time variations was this amazing spectrum, this periodic spectrum that is anchored at one Martian day or Sol, as it's called, a little bit longer than an Earth day, and every harmonic as far as you can count. So this is essentially due to rotation uh, of the planet under its forming and, and kind of dissolving ionosphere. Um, 
the ionosphere doesn't completely go away at night, but it it it, it kind of collapses. And so somehow this this diurnal change is exciting a huge number of harmonics. So we were very excited about this. Uh, every one of these harmonics must indicate a sectoral component of a of a of a source field that you you know you know that that the source field occurs at that period and has a spatial structure associated with you know one over two one over three one over four of the planetary circumference but we don't know what the zonal structure is and in spite of a couple of years worth of work we were unsuccessful in inferring the geometry of those signals such that the GDS method could be applied there's still a few tricks that could that could be done um, but uh, looking forward to you know what you could do with the MT experiment I studied this back in the in the early aughts um, this is a more recent uh, diagram of a couple on the left of a couple of configurations with and without groundwater. And this is just the asymptotic Bostic inversion showing, you know, what frequencies uh, probe to what depth. And you could see that, you know, kind of up in the hundreds of millihertz to hertz range, um, we could see brines on, on, on Mars. Unfortunately, we don't know whether those uh, signals exist on Mars or not. Um, so sending MT would be something of a risk, even though it's not a huge uh, experiment. It would have to be, um, you know, found a way to do it on the cheap. The other thing that I looked at in the meantime, uh, a decade or more ago, was the possibility of doing an artificial source. So the, tra the transient uh, EM method is widely used uh, on Earth and competes with controlled source EM uh, in many cases. Of course, we're talking about a much higher mass and cost than MT, but uh, if it's big enough, we have no uncertainty about the source strength. Um, and uh, I did an earlier work, including a prototype development. Uh, I worked with JPL for several years, trying to uh, renew this, uh, this concept. We both built prototypes that deployed closed loops, closed transmitter loops of, at 100 meter scale. Um, it doesn't have to be a square or a loop. Uh, it can be a triangle. It's just the moment that matters. Uh, and so these, this part was successful, but we just, you know, ran out of, ran out of steam and, and interest uh, in both uh, experiments. Um, uh, and so if we do look for uh, groundwater on Mars, it's probably going to be with, with MT again. So um, I'm going to wrap up. Uh, you know, in general, we know that EM sounding can provide uh, key information on, on many worlds in the solar system, both rocky uh, and icy bodies. And many people in the planetary community think all I need is a magnetometer. Uh, it can be that simple if you have additional knowledge on the source field and, and understanding that is of course the key. And then what kind of bandwidth limitations that introduces. MT has the distinct advantage of being a single station um, that we don't need source info and having uh, the best bandwidth of any method. It's relatively low mass and low power. And we're very lucky to be uh, uh, sending empty experiments to the moon now in 2024 and 2025. I hope they don't slip further. There will be EM sounding experiments done, not MT, from uh, Jupiter and Mercury orbiting spacecraft later in this decade. And then perhaps we can make write some proposals to do series in Mars uh, in the 2030s. So uh, I'd like to end by thanking you all for attending as well as uh, NASA um, throughout my career, really, but uh, for these four programs in the last decade that, that really led to the development of the instrument. And then of course, to my colleagues uh, at Swery Helios Space and Goddard that actually built the instrument. So thank you and I uh, welcome discussion now. Thank you, Bob, for an excellent talk. I see some claps coming in and we've got a, a great um, group of attendees today. We've got about 50 people who have joined. Um, so I see that there's a few questions in the Q&A and coming in in the chat. That's excellent. What I would like to do is actually invite folks uh, to raise your hand and I can allow you to jump um, right on in and ask your questions to Bob directly. It makes things a lot more engaging. Um, excellent. All right. Um, Lon, I'll invite you to uh, join us here. Um, okay. <clears throat> can you hear me? Yes, we've got you. Okay. Hi, Bob. Uh, nice, nice presentation. Uh, very good. 
Uh, I just noticed a couple of little things in your abstract that I wanted to uh, mention. Uh, for example, a very small thing, you mentioned that the um, uh, the interior of the moon was investigated in 1979. The landing occurred in 1979, but of course the investigations began later, uh, starting in 1971 or so, and continued on for more than a decade after that. <clears throat> Also, you say that the useful transfer function uh, bandwidth by transfer function, you mean the dual magnetometer method with a surface magnetometer and a, an orbital magnetometer. Um, <clears throat> bandwidth only a resolved depths of 400 to 1200 kilometers, but uh, you really should mention that uh, a number of studies, in particular Sonnet et al., 1972 presented some pretty detailed results on conductivity estimates at depths as shallow as 138 kilometers, about 1,600 kilometers radius. Now, I know you're aware of that. You pro it was probably just an oversight that you didn't mention that in your abstract. No, I I, I discarded that. I'll, I'll explain more. Okay. All right. <clears throat> well, I think you should publish why you're discarding it. I'm desperately trying to, Juan. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay. Um, then the other thing is, uh, while the MT method uh, has certainly been applied successfully at the surface of the Earth, which has an insulating atmosphere, it has not yet been demonstrated to work uh, on the surface of the moon, which is immersed in the solar wind plasma most, most of the time, or in a uh, another plasma environment like the magneto sheath or the um, uh, magneto tail, and so we really need to demonstrate that it will work, and I hope it will work because it would be a great uh, addition. But um, we need to see it, uh, see that demonstrated. Uh, well, that's what we're trying to do. Okay. But I, I think, as I understand it, you will have the be able to use the transfer function method as a backup if you have an orbital uh, magnetometer. Is that correct? Yeah, we expect that these that the Artemis spacecraft, no relation to the Artemis program, will mm -hmm. still be or operating uh, and orbiting the moon um, for many years to come. And so we can we can repeat the transfer function uh, again. Though uh, I only anticipate it being useful below about a millihertz like you did. Mm -hmm. So yeah, okay. if I could turn to your, um, I can answer your questions in order. I, I thought I used the dates of your swaths in your 1982 paper. Um, mm -hmm. um, so maybe I got that wrong. So I'll fix the dates. Mm -hmm. um, when, you know, uh, I, I did not think much of the inversions that Sonnet did uh, in that 72 uh, paper. And I did compare directly to Hobbes um, who may be on this call, um, his uh, minimum depth also, he cut it off at 200 kilometers. Uh, so um, uh, I, 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 just, I just don't believe that result going mm. shallower. Um, when you talk about the, um, the plasma, yes, it's immersed in a conductor, but marine MT has been done for several decades now, which is, induced, which is immersed in the seafloor conductor, more conductive than the interior of the earth that it's trying to investigate below that. So, mm -hmm. so that, that part is fun. I agree with you, the very last point, um, what are the other effects in the plasma? And, and so those would be non-inductive effects, um, you know, static effects, for example, that, that we need to, to look at carefully. Um, I do have a small cadre of space physicists on the team, uh, maybe more than geophysicists. And um, so, you know, Number one, we'd like to just you know identify those signals and take them out. Number two, um, it's it's conceivable that you know because we're fitting an inductive signature that it would just be some kind of systematic uh, effect that we can fit through. So so yes, uh, we will learn about the deep conductivity of the moon at the two sites using just the magnetic transfer function, uh, and these um, are experiments uh, for the MT method. Uh, um, per se on, on, on in, in, in new environments. Okay, let me go ahead and ask the other questions too, just to get them out of the way. 
Uh, you mentioned a Grimm 2023 uh, paper. Uh, is that, has that been published yet? It's. I saw you a month ago at LPSC. I haven't submitted it yet. Okay. And also in the, the where exactly is the landing site in Chrysium? Uh, it is, um, have they released it? Uh, it's about 18 and a half north, 61.8 east. Okay, um, because there are two strong magnetic anomalies, as you probably already know. One is in the northern half yep. of the basin, and the other is in the southern half of the basin. Yep, so, I picked it to be in between them. It's at the lowest. Uh, it's at the lowest static field in the oh, area. You picked you picked the landing site. Yes. Great. That's good. That you want to be as far away from those as you possibly can because the, the solar wind will be interacting with those anomalies and generating transient currents and fields and it could be very difficult to uh, analyze the data. Also in Schrodinger, there are crustal fields in Schrodinger. They're not there that strong, not as strong as the ones in Christium, but there are some fields in Yeah, they're, they're really small on the Schrodinger uh, fields. Okay, well, nevertheless, they're probably comparable to those at Apollo 12, I would guess. Okay. So, anyway, though that those were the main comments that I had on on uh, the approach. But I, in general, I wish you good luck. I hope it works. I hope the first one works, and you get some interesting uh, results that come out of this, and maybe we'll be. Um, on the way to doing more EM sounding elsewhere in the solar system. Well, thank you very much. You know that uh, that I, in particular, uh, you know, look to you as the as the godfather of uh, uh, of, uh, of of these you know approaches for the moon. Well, I'd, uh, I'd say Charles Sonnet. Charles well, Sonnet is the I, real I, godfather. I, say, <laughs> I didn't want to say surviving. Sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, and uh, and so um, yeah, uh, uh, I'm 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 always thinking of you when I'm. Looking at this. Okay. Thanks, Lon. Um, I'll invite Alexander to uh, jump on in. Right. Um, okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, we've got you. Thanks. Uh, this is Alexander uh, Greiwer here. So thanks for 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 the interesting talk. I actually just posted some of these questions, but I thought that I might as well uh, ask them like um, live. So. The first one is on this uh, statement or that the source info is not needed for MT. I think it's it's a bit more nuanced than that, right? Because if the source field varies on scales larger than skin depths, then this plane wave impedance is valid. But beyond that, the the the, the spectral impedance will depend on the spherical harmonic degree of the of the of the source and the source effects and the geometry may still enter the game, especially for a very resistive moon at low frequencies. Um, is that not the case? So yeah, I think we both said the same thing, that as long as the, 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 the wavelength of the source is much larger than the wavelength in the ground, which of course is larger than a skin depth, then the MT method should be valid. Um, so, you know, we would have to, uh, uh, you know, if, if, if the MT method fails for some reason at very low frequencies, I'm not worried because we have, you know, we have this transfer function method as well. Um, and actually our, uh, electrode bandwidth, uh, the, the electrometer bandwidth will, will roll off at low frequencies, you know, you know way under a millihertz, mm -hmm. but, um, at, yeah. So, so at high frequency, then we're then we're having to say, um, you know, uh, if we'd have to be in a situation where the the source field wavelength would have to be, you know, under a thousand kilometers, um, and that would be a pretty high order spherical, you know, harmonic. Uh, so, yeah. I mean, it's 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 possible. We don't we just don't know how how high the multipoles could be excited uh, for the moon when the incident wave is basically a plane wave. Uh, but um, yeah, I mean, we we yeah we, okay. That I I just I probably missed that that part of your talk. So sorry if you if you talked about that um, uh, already. 
and and you know the, the the second thing that that partially resonates with the previous uh, uh, you know uh, person asking questions and that, that's basically what we observe for earth i mean these galvanic distortions um the galvanic distortions which can we you know one uh sort of kind of this distortion is a static shift in electric fields right so the systematic bias of of the electric fields and that's a really issue that that is difficult to deal with if you if you have only one stations and those distortions they can bias electric fields by orders of magnitude so you Absolutely. can be you know <laughs> so, yeah, so my, my understanding to... i'm sorry so my understanding of static shift is that it's due to you know incomplete sampling uh it's it's aliasing um, and and so you know you have you have an electrode or both electrodes are in a locally conductive say right. region compared to where and so your skin depth is not shallow enough to probe into that right okay and so in the moon I'm having a hard time getting the skin depth below fifty or hundred kilometers and the resistivity at the surface is is you know ten to the fourth ten to the sixth ten to the eighth ohmmeters so. Uh, uh, you know, un un unless there's a big heterogeneity um, that that's that's at, at tens or hundreds of kilometers depth, that would that would, that would be causing a lateral bias. I don't think the classical conception of static shift applies to the moon because it's so I mean, resistive at the surface. Okay, you, you I mean the question is how how homogeneous it is, you know, at at these scales. Uh, I mean, it's relative to the skin depth, obviously. I mean, if if it's inhomogeneous on the scales, so you know, uh, smaller than the skin depth, and those homogeneities are strong enough, you, you will have static shift. It's it's in you know, regardless right. where you are on Earth or on Moon. Um, but this is just okay. I mean, this is just something to. Uh, uh, I mean, this is kind of an Earth experience, you know, and another experience that we. Have on Earth is that these temperature variations and potential contamination of, you know, lander, for instance, in this case, if magnetometer is mounted on the lander, can be really an issue. I mean, even the natural temperature variations on the Earth affect our instruments, and that's why we bury them. Um, so, and you know, the experience with insight, you know, the, the, the struggle with insight instrument is partially caused by these huge uh, variations in in the measured magnetic field that are due to temperature and the lander so what, what what's your sort of uh what's well your... i mean yeah so we don't worry too much about the electric field uh any any problems with right. that yeah. um magnetic you know, the, the, the probes are far away um yeah. uh yeah i mean we would we have a two and a half meter mast that's the longest for a magnetometer, you know, because because when we met with this proposal, we didn't know anything about what the lander would be. The landers are selected afterwards. You don't work with the lander team; they just assign it. Uh, and so we we proposed like we we got to get this magnetometer as far away as we can. Um, within the realm of of, of space flight experience, uh, people will typically put a flux gate on a two meter boom, um, and and then by carefully studying, you know the changes throughout the mission will will calibrate out any residual magnetic field signature so you know we're going to be much much better than insight um and we're okay. going to do a we're going to do a, a magnetic characterization test with the lander uh this fall to understand you know what are the fields around the lander that we can anticipate um the 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 time variations uh with temperature uh has to all be done out you know we, we can't control that um and so that 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 has to be done through through calibration yeah okay i mean the, thanks a lot really i wish i wish you good luck and i hope it works it will be a huge uh, milestone and uh, thanks thank you very much thanks alexander see a couple uh comments coming in from dennis woods here um he says he feels like an insider on the highest level of interplanetary science fascinating so a uh, thanks and his other comment is is uh if you find an e-field static shift at the lunar mt site maybe you found a massive sulfide uh, nickel ore body so right. <laughs> there you have so, it so yeah i mean the, that that 
the, the moon may very well have ore deposits, but they would be entirely of the magmatic segregation kind because you know huge volumes of hydrothermal fluids have never circulated through the crust of the moon. But it is conceivable that that you know there could be a differentiated uh, you know lava flow or something that would have that would have metals in it. So you know maybe so. <laughs> there you have it. Well, you have to keep us posted. All right. I don't see uh, any more questions coming in at this point. So I wanted to say a really big thanks, Bob. Very much appreciated your talk. I think you've opened up uh, eyes and opportunities to, you know, where some of the methods that we're familiar with on Earth uh, could have some, you know, scientific impacts uh, in a different community. So very, very much appreciated. Thanks, Lindsay. Thanks, everybody. All right. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.